Good evening everyone and thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us for this webinar. My name is Siwan Howerton and I'm a dairy scientist at AHDB Dairy. I'm delighted to bring you tonight's webinar on how to minimise silage losses this winter. Our presenters today are Rolf Spondley and Elizabeth Nadu from Sweden. Tonight's webinar is being delivered as part of the Euro Dairy Network. This network includes 14 countries from Ireland to Poland and Sweden to Italy. It aims to put farmers at the centre of practice, best practice innovations by sharing knowledge and solutions. You can find more about Euro Dairy by visiting www.eurodairy.eu. Tonight's webinar has proved very popular with nearly 160 registrations from dairy farmers, vets, nutritionists, consultants and researchers from 15 countries right across Europe and the world. Rolf and Elizabeth will run through their presentation which will take about 40 minutes and then there will be time for comments and questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar but if anyone would like to ask any questions then please type in your question box on the left hand side of your screen. I will ask Rolf and Elizabeth your questions at the end of the presentation. We will aim to finish up within the hour. I would like to thank our digital manager Elena who is working behind the scenes and will endeavour to keep this webinar running as smooth as possible. But please do bear with us if we do encounter any technical difficulties. We will try and keep these to a minimum. So without further delay, I am delighted to introduce our speakers tonight. Rolf is an Associate Professor at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. His interest is in feed evaluation and preservation, especially in the relationship between ensiling silages and dairy cow nutrition. His research focuses on developing methods to reduce nutrient losses and in nutrient losses as ensiling, increasing forages utilisation and feed efficiency. Our second speaker is Elizabeth and she has previously spent 11 years in America researching forage conservation and dairy cow nutrition. She is and now an associate professor at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences. Her research is currently focusing on silages, the use of additives and forage utilisation by ruminants. Elizabeth has a joint appointment with the Rural Economy and Agriculture Society, where she works with farm advisor to transfer knowledge onto Swedish dairy farms. So without any further delay, it's over to you, Rolf. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you all see my slides now. It's called silage losses. Most of it is invisible. Uh, I am, uh, my ambition tonight is to convince you that you've got losses when you are doing silage and quite big losses, even though you won't see it. Mostly you don't see it. And my biggest problem actually in reality is to convince people, convince farmers that they really have got losses. Uh, now I see why it's not moving to the next slide. Now it comes. First of all, I mean, we are talking about ensiling. I mean, that's a kind of preservation, it's a me preservation method of forage. Either we have to dry the hay, take away the, the dry the grass to take away the, the water so the bugs and the mold is not growing, or we have to take away the oxygen and then it's ensiling we are talking about, or we have to store it with low temperature. But to put the grass in a freezer, that's not uh, economical, of course. But some of us living in the northern part of Europe actually is doing a sort of a combination by between ensiling and low temperature. Because even though if we cannot really get rid of all oxygen, we get help of a low temperature to preserve the crop. That is a bigger problem in southern part of Europe where you don't have the low winter temperatures. Just to set the, the scheme for tonight, I mean, what we are talking about mostly is ensiling the grass crop. I'm going to talk only about ensiling grass crops. Many of you who are listening tonight, we are doing a silage with the, with the, um, the maize uh, instead. But I mean, that's the same 
idea, that's the same theory behind it. So those of you who are not in siling grass, please think maize instead, but I'm going to talk about grass all the time. And when we are making silage out of grass, we are cutting it like this. We are broad spreading it in order to get it a little bit drier. And when we do that, we in instantly start to some sort of losses. We have some field losses because the crop doesn't really accept or understand that it is dead when you cut it. It keeps on living and then you have an enzymatic respiration in the crop forming carbon dioxide and already here you have some losses. You see the carbon dioxide goes off and you don't really can see it but something is happening and there is some heat created as well and the heat of course you cannot feel because it's out there being cooled on the field. The, on the right side of this picture you have a worst case. If you don't take it up from the field fast enough you will have washing out from bad weather and also when you take it up and if it's too dry you get physical losses because of mechanical treatment. Here is the machine, the tedding machine who makes swaths out of the grass when it has been broad spread. And already here you can imagine that you've got some field losses. You break off the very dry fine particles of the grasses and you drop it on the field and you have some field losses. And after it is, uh, when we take it up, it goes like this. Either you have a machine which is um, picking it up quite fast with a loading wagon or a fine uh, a loader wagon we call it, or you make it much fast, slower, but you cut it in finer particles with a chopping wagon. It goes like this. Or you have a self-propelled, one of these class Jaguars, which is so common. And also here you can see, you can have some losses if you are not carefully to really find your right way to uh, get it into the wagon, and you can see. And here as well, it is the most valuable parts of the grass that you lose because it's the fine particles where it's the highest concentration of energy and protein. Taking it home and putting it into the silos, either the tower silos or you put it in the bunker silos. And I'm quite sure that most of you are listening tonight, you are doing something like this, putting the grass in bunker silos. And this is quite a nice picture where you are trying to, to um, compact the side, the grass very carefully. You can see here is a extra weight on the tractor with 11 uh, wheels from a, a railway, which is extra weight to make it really compact. Or you can put it in a, in a, um, a tube or a sausage, or we can call it, we used to call it a tube silo like this, which also is a way to get it quite uh, protected from the air. Or the most easiest and the cheapest one is to make a clamp silo, just a big heap which you cover with the, with the plastic afterwards. And here's a picture of all of these ty silo types. And in the middle is also the round bale silage, which goes like this. And most of you have of course seen it before, but if you are not living in our country in Sweden, I'm not so sure that you have seen the way we are doing the round bales in the very end here. Most other countries, they roll the, the bales out on the grass, but we in this country always want to have them standing up like uh, toilet rolls like that. You see it when it comes out. Normally we cover it with six layers of plastic of, uh, of this um, sheet, the, the stretch film. You can see there are many more layers on the flat sides of the bale and therefore it, it doesn't get so easily punctured when it comes out and stands up instead. Now we come into some the theory here. This is a very classical illustration of the dry matter losses which occurs and this is what we are going to concentrate tonight. You can see the dry matter losses on the y-axis here. It goes from 10 up to 30 percent and here on the bottom you can see the dry matter content of the silage. It's 15 percent up to 85 percent when it's ready hay. And here is the losses. This curve is the loss, the total loss. And when you have very wet silage you will have a lot of of seepage or press water coming out from the silo and you have high losses up to 30 percent of the dry matter. But if you pre-wilt it as we do when let it stay for a day or 24 hours on the ground, we can pre-wilt it and get a higher dry matter content and then you will see that the dry matter is increased up to 30 or 35 percent and you can decrease the losses to below 20 percent somewhere here and it's the storage losses that is decreased. And then when we go on and uh, dry the crop even further, all the way up to you get it to hay, you get lower and lower storage losses. But on the other hand, the feed losses, they increase because you break so many 
fine particles of the grass and you end up with about 30% losses again. This is a classical diagram that you always have to keep in mind that somewhere here is the it's the dry matter content of the crop where you actually can achieve the lowest dry matter losses. And this is what is happening when you're ensiling. You have about 15% sugars in the grass and by letting it, in, taking away the oxygen, by covering it in the silo, the lactic acid bacteria, they will consume these sugars and decrease it from 15% dry matter just to down to five. It eats about 10% units of it and makes lactic acid and uh, acetic acid out of it instead. You can see this lactic acid and acetic acid increases here. If you have it a little bit drier, then they, it doesn't take so much sugar. You keep on with 10% of this originally 15% sugars of the dry matter and, uh, and the lactic acid bacteria produces less lactic acid and you don't decrease the pH so much. And it happens a bit more because this is from, from um, carbohydrate fermentation, but the protein content, the protein in the grass also is sort of something, something happens with the protein as well. You can see here is the ammonia nitrogen in percentage of total nitrogen, of percentage of total protein here. You can see there is no, no ammonia at all in the grass, but as a bad consequence of this fermentation, this is increasing and as wetter the grass is, the more ammonia nitrogen you get in the crop. And this is something Elizabeth will take up in her presentation very much more, so we'll leave it for now. But back to the results of the full scale and siling and the losses. So this is how it looks like, quite nice. The guy here uh, is uh, soon going to cover when it's really full, his silo. But in the winter when you open it, it could look like in the, in the, quite often as in the lower part of the picture here. You can lose about 30 to, 20 to 30 percent of it easily. And this is quite a typical, this is one of our older silos. The white stuff on the top is the snow in Sweden. And then you have some layer for, for I think we have put on some straw here and here you have the uh, plastic. And then you can see, an, oh, where did it go? Here, uh, you can see along the sides here, it's quite dark brown, not really black, but it's really bad quality and it doesn't stink, but it doesn't smell silage either. And quite many farmers, they take away this. Other farmers, they still keep on and feed it, but it is quite risky sometimes, it could be quite bad. So this is a, a good illustration of that about 70 or 80 percent of the silage is what you can feed, the rest is going to be bad quality because of air inlet. Sometimes it's so bad that you can even see the mold. And here is another very important, also after Zimmer. You can see that, I will try to see here, where are the big losses and where can we do something about, what can we do about it? Unavoidable, that is a respiration in the beginning. I mean, that is the enzymes and the, and the microorganisms is unavoidable and it's invisible of course as well and but it's just about one or two or three four percent of the of the of the dry matter that is lost in that way then we come down from here here we can do something about it either we have too high too low dry matter content so we get press water and then we can get up to seven percent of losses or we dry too much so it's getting too too um, dry and then we have some field losses and then we also get a bit higher losses. But it's when we're coming d further down it's getting worse and worse. Here it is clostridial fermentation instead of um, lactic acid bacteria and that is avoidable because clostridial fermentation is something you get if you contaminate the crop with soil or something else, run into it with tractors with dirty wheels. But here, coming down to the aerobic degradation during the storage and the aerobic degradation during takeout, here you have two digits losses. 10% you can come up to here and 15% you can come up to here. And this is also invisible, but it is avoidable, very much avoidable, because here you can do a lot to avoid these big losses. So if you only keep on with the low un avoidable losses in the beginning, you can keep it down to about five, six, seven percent losses. But if you are not careful with the compaction and with the air tightness, the ceiling, you can be up to 40 percent losses. 
and you can see even this is known for ages for centuries almost because you can see from the 1990s and 60s when they made investigations there were about 11 up to 20 30 percent almost or at least 25 percent losses with all big big silo structures except when we are doing investigations on the round bales they are down to very low uh, losses and what is the big what is the big difference between the large silo and the small silo well the bunker silo it is often not compacted well enough and it's not sealed good enough and you have the losses during the storage to, because air is leaking in rainwater is leaking in and with the rainwater it comes also oxygen and you have losses during the unloading because you have to imagine that a, a, a bunker silo could be open for weeks or sometimes months and of course the air will enter the, the surface but the small round bale they are opened and consumed the same day so they have much less and it's easier to to uh, get it sealed correctly as well because you have the plastic all around it and why is it inv invisible? Yes, it's because when the air comes into you have a microbial growth which is primarily yeast and then you get carbon dioxide which goes away like a gas and it's, you can't see it and you get some water but you get a lot of heat and that you can't see either but you can feel it or measure it. We made some own studies in, in laboratory silos where we have small, very completely tight bottles like this with 1.7 liters and we have them either completely tight or we ventilate them very, very little. You see the small holes and we have we remove those small stoppers two times a week, one time a week just for two hours, two hours every Friday and then we measured what happened. Completely sealed or open these small millimeter holes for two hours per week. You can see when they are ventilated, the red one, you have double as high losses as when it was closed. So they all have losses during the ensiling time when it's stored. It's stored 100 days. But what was, what was actually very much worse, that was when we opened the silo. You can see the, the blue line here. This is the closed silos. So this is 96 hours. That's four days after opening. It's kept the temperature and was stable, no aerobic um, instability was happening during the four, four days. But when you have it ventilated just for these two hours per week, it raised from 20 up to 35 degrees within one day, within 24 hours. And that was because by having small, small inlet of oxygen, you will keep the yeast alive during the conservation time and when you finally open the silo and let in the air which is unavoidable because you have to feed out then the yeast start to grow and create heat and here are some other researchers from Wen and Weinberg who made more or less the same thing they opened those small bottles when they had 10 percent losses and they let it stay for three days for four days or for seven days and you can see the dry method it was higher and higher and higher after opening and the temperature is was raising it was the yeast to start to grow when you open them we wanted to see what was the difference between silos so we went out to 12 bunker silos at 12 different farms and six tube silos and three tower silos and numerous of round bales and we weighed all in and we sampling every load and we inserted temperature loggers in the silos and this is what happened. Bunker silos continuously produced heat and the fuel is the nutrient in the silage. Look at this silo for example. This silo had 27% dry matter losses. It was made in the northern part of Sweden in July 2014. It was 16, 18 degrees outside but just the first day it went up to 42 degrees and then it kept on with this temperature. It's logged every hour during the time and you can see how it goes. It ends up with a temperature of 18 degrees in February and you have to keep in mind that this is in Sweden. From December to February it's minus degrees in Sweden, it's minus 10 degrees in this area but inside the silo it's still plus 18 degrees and where does this heat come from? It comes from the nutrient in the silage, it's the invisible loss. The bunker silo here in another farm who has completely different results, you can see only 5% dry matter losses instead of 27 they lost the other farm. Here the temperature rises only to 24 and it goes down to 8 degrees. What did he do in order to make it so much better? 
this is the result from all our 12 bunker silos. It was close to 15% dry matter losses. And you can see the red one, that is the invisible, and this is how much they're thrown away. It's about 3-4%, which the farmers know they take away because it looks bad, and the rest of it is the un invisible. And you can see here, the, this is the tower silos, but the zone, we had only three of them, so it could be a bit unfair that we were unlucky, because there were numbers of these silos also with very high losses. So this average is much more stable. But look at the round bales, almost nothing. Variation, as I said, was very big. Here is the, the 12 bunker silos, and you can see this one, for example, with 18% losses. 442 ton green crop was put in. Contrast to this one, the very good one, 328 tons, and only 3% losses. And you can see on the last line, 14% 14 14 was the mean, and the variation, um, and, the, and there was 3% thrown away, and the, the total was 14%. So, the characteristics for those who have no losses, they had a slow filling, maximum 15 centimeters of grass layer for each packing with the tractors. And they continued to pack the day after the silo was full. They weren't that very fast in closing the silo, surprisingly. And on top of the plastic cover on the silo, they had sent a layer of 10% about of, or a 10 centimeter of sand. And again, this is not from the farm with a very low um, re, um, dry matter losses, but anyway, it's a good picture of how to do it, to compact it carefully and a lot. And there's a common problem that is increasing in many countries, because people are getting bigger and bigger machines, a higher machine capacity to make the harvest faster and faster. And what is the action? Because we saw that when you have a fast filling, you have a low rate, a low compaction, you, had, you don't put uh, enough time in the compaction, and that means that if you're, for example, filling two silos, normally you do it one silo first and then the next silo, and then instead of do that, keep the two silos open and fill them at the same time, fill them simultaneously. It takes double as long time to fill the silo, to fill two silos instead of filling them after each other, and you get much more time to do the compaction with the tractor, and arrange another tractor so you can go compacting in both of them during the filling. This is from the picture from the farm with the extremely low, uh, with a good result. And uh, you can look at how it looks like when you have really compacted silage. You can feel it, it looks like the tractor is running on a beach. You can see the wheels make marks in the, in the silage. This farm has only down to 5% losses. So, I think that I will continue, I mean, I, th I hope that I have convinced you that you have a lot of, of um, losses in your bunker silos and the way to, to avoid it is to increase your packing much more than you would normally do and, and cover it very, very carefully. And there is a way to, to make this understandable and also you have a, down here you have an email address where you can go, it's open for everyone, it's made in America, it's an open country. And um, it's a calculator, and it looks like this. Uh, I hope you can see these small figures. These yellow uh, cells here, they are things that you could fill in and change. And you can say here, first of all, you have to fill in how high are your bunker walls. Three meter I've filled in. And how high do you fill? I also fill three meters. You know, it's different because sometimes it could be like you are filling over the rim, and then you can have a higher figure there. But then comes the next figure, and that is, how many tons do you fill every hour? Silage delivery rate to bunker, or actually grass delivery to the bunker. And that is 30 ton in the, the standard uh, figures, which is here. I will change them soon. And 30% dry matter, you write 0.3 here, and the thickness of the layers that you spread out before you run over each layer with a tractor. That's recommended to about, uh, 15 centimeter, and then you go down and tell the weight of the tractors, 9 ton, and how long time do you pack this? It's 100% of the time because it's packing all the time, and another tractor that is packing 50% of the time, this is the tractor time here, 50%, because this is the tractor who's filling at the same time. Now you have filled in the, the yellow cells, and you go down here and you can see the result. 
The result here is 222.6 kilogram dry matter per cubic meter. I used to say that coming over 200 is a good result in, uh, in a bunker silo. Uh, scientifically, we actually want to have them over 240 or 250, but we seldom reach that one, so over 200 is more or less good. But just remember this, 222 um, kilogram per uh, dry matter per cubic meter. We go up here and let us think that this guy, he, he got the, the, the contractor, he bought the, the, from the contractor a uh, class um, Jaguar chopper and he, come, he could fill his silo twice as fast. So instead of getting 30 tons every hour, he gets 60 tons. I put in 60 tons here. And it's still 30% dry matter, but of course then he has no layers of 15 centimeter because it, the loads are coming double as fast, so he has 30 centimeter instead. And then you go down and he has the same tractors, and you go down and see what is the result. 162 kilogram dry matter per cubic meter, that is very much too low. And even if he goes up here and he says, well, I get a big tractor, I put in a tractor with 12,000 kilos in both of them instead. And then you go down and see you are up to 173 kilogram dry matter per cubic meter. And what is, what, why is it so important? It's so important to have a higher density because when you open your silo and you take your weeks or months in order to feed it out, the air will penetrate into the silo and if it is loosely packed, this, the air will penetrate far in and it will heat up and you will lose a lot of your crop. But if it's very hard packed, then the air can't penetrate. It goes just in some half a meter, and that is the quantity that you take out the next day. So it doesn't really start to heat up. So this compaction is a real crucial um, factor for having a successful ensiling. Uh, and I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. And uh, this is Elizabeth, and uh, I will start talking about the biological factors affecting dry matter losses during storage and feed out of the silage. As uh, Rolf uh, mentioned uh, about his trial where he weighed all forage in and all, all the silage out, uh, I want to um, it mentioned this German trial that was going on for four years uh, where they showed dry matter losses from bunker silos from 9 to 12 percent on average depending on what crop that was ensiled. But uh, you, there is a large variation within each crop. Exactly as uh, Rolf pointed out too, the large variability. Also, good technique was used here in this experiment. Well, then it must be uh, the biological factors that affect, uh, you know, the dry matter losses during the fermentation. And um, we have <coughs> Uh, it's, mo it's mostly the uh, presence of Clostridia and yeast in the silage that causes the dry matter losses during storage of the silage. Um, the <clears throat> it's uh, the Clostridia bacteria ferment sugars and lactic acid to butyric acid. And the anaerobic yeast, uh, when they grow, they produce ethanol. And uh, that will de increase dry matter losses. Uh, here we have uh, from trials with lucerne and grass. Another trial will hold crop rice silage. Uh, we have, we see when we increase the ethanol concentration in this silage, we get an increased dry matter loss during the fermentation. And this is probably, probably mostly due to the anaerobic yeast growth, but it can also be heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria that produces ethanol and others. With this graph, I want to show you the high variability that we have uh, between different crops being ensiled and uh, the, it's also related to the dry matter content of uh, uh, these crops being ensiled. 
that it's also the microbial content on the forage at ensiling that has an effect. Uh, so as a safeguard, you can, we can decrease these dry matter losses during storage by use of silage additives. And uh, this is a summary of 121 trials uh, where different kinds of crops have been ensiled. And um, when the chemical additives containing active substances against Clostridia. Uh, you get the decrease in dry matter losses by 40 to 45 percent compared with the untreated control. Also the homolactic, homofermentative lactic acid bacteria that we have in, bac in bacterial inoculants can have an increase in uh, 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 it will decrease dry matter losses uh, because they are specialists in producing lactic acid and in that way decreasing silage pH. And uh, when you combine this uh, homofermentative lactic acid bacteria with heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria, which produce acetic acid uh, in um, addition to lactic acid and <clears throat> and also a transfer lactic acid into acetic acid. You can, depending on what, what kind of these bacteria are dominating the process, you get different decreases in dry matter losses. And the salt-based additives containing active substances against yeast and uh, clostridia growth also decrease dry matter losses by having more efficient fermentation. And uh, <clears throat> so the presence of volatile compounds is related to, in the silage, is related to dry matter losses. And by use of homofermentative lactic acid bacteria, you can decrease the presence of volatile compounds in the silage. And the volatile compounds or the volatile fatty acids like the acetic, butyric and propionic, and also the alcohols of which ethanol is the most pr predominant. And uh, when you decrease the volatile compounds, you decrease the dry matter losses during storage. And uh, when you use uh, a, a combination product of homofermentative and heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria, the decrease in dry matter losses depends on what we which one of these uh, lactic acid bacteria will be dominating the fermentation process. Um, by adding a salt-based additive or an acid-based additive, you also decrease the dry matter losses by having a more efficient fermentation. It's, it's, it is important to use the right kind of um, microbial inoculant uh, to this crop being ensiled. Here we have silage which uh, is dominated by red clover and in that silage we had presence of clostridia. We have high count of clostridia spores in the control silage and uh, but by adding homofermentative lactic acid bacteria uh, with the additive uh, to the silage, uh, you um, inhibit the clostridia growth and you decrease dry matter losses. And you get the same effect here with the combination product. But do not use the heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria to this kind of silage because they are specialists in producing acetic acid and will not decrease the pH uh, sufficient enough to inhibit clostridia growth. So, um, uh, but by decreasing the dry matter losses in the bales, in these experiments we use bales, we get more dry matter left in the bales after the storage and we have more dry matter to feed to the cows. Especially this is shown in this trial, in the bale trial, where we had decrease in dry matter losses by use of a, a biological additive and, and a chemical additive. And that gives us more 
uh, kilogram dry matter left in the bag after storage compared with the untreated silage. Well, once you open the silo, as Rolf mentioned too here, you, it's, uh, it's a risk for getting heating of the silage uh, during air exposure. And in the experiment, we test this as uh, an aerobic stability test. And we are doing that by putting temperature, temperature loggers in the silage uh, in a tube and uh, let air flow through the silage during a time period of up to two weeks. And um, then we calculate the number of hours or days before the temperature in the aerated silage rises two degrees above ambient temperature. And that's how we record aerobic stability. When you open the silo and uh, <clears throat> the yeast will start grow. And if you have a lots of yeast in the silage at opening, you will decrease aerobic stability. I mean, that silage will start heating quicker than a silage that has less yeast in it. So, in the control, the control silage of this grass clover silage was only stable for five days. And uh, this, uh, so it was uh, aerobic deterioration occurring in the silage. Uh, so during this uh, two-week period, the organic matter digestibility of the silage decreased by about five percentage units at least in the control silage. But uh, the silage was treated with the various additives, had less of a uh, decrease in the organic matter digestibility. And especially the salt-based additive, it showed no decrease in digestibility over the two-week period. And <clears throat> so uh, this uh, decrease in digestibility, you know, that gives dry matter losses because uh, it's the digestible nutrients that have been, uh, that have disappeared. So that's why you get a decrease in the silage digestibility. In another silage uh, trial with grass silage in uh, small silos that was uh, stored during air stress. So uh, we had these small holes uh, in the silage with the stoppers that we removed from the holes uh, during uh, two occasions uh, for 24 hours each. And when we air stressed the silage, the control silage was only stable for yeah, less than two days. So it started heating after two days. That led to a decrease in uh, organic matter digestibility during a test period of 11 and a half days of almost seven percentage units. Whereas in the silage where uh, heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria was uh, added, uh, the silage was stable for the whole uh, test period. And also when it was treated with a combination product. So, and uh, also the salt-based additive increased to some extent aerobic stability, which led to no de decrease in organic matter digestibility during the test period. So there was good silage still, uh, still good to be used to the cows with a high organic matter digestibility. May silage is very uh, susceptible to heating after you have opened the silo because you have so much good nutrients, good carbohydrates in there uh, that the yeast like to grow on. And in this trial we had yeast in the control silage and uh, at opening of the silo. And there was, that started taking heat after uh, less than five days after opening of the silo. Whereas when we use the salt-based additive to the maize silage, the active substances in this additive, it inhibited yeast growth and made the sta silage stable for the whole test period of two weeks. 
in another maize silage trial, we opened the glass jars after 28 days of fermentation and after 110 days of fermentation. And we see that the decrease in organic matter digestibility uh, was quicker uh, from the silage that was only had a short uh, storage period than for the silage that uh, was stored for a longer time. It's because you have gotten more, you know, more into a stable phase and so, but they are both losing digestibility because, and that creates big dry matter losses. These are silages without additives. So uh, here we have the si control silage at 110 days of opening. And it was stable for five days and it started heating after that. And during that heating process then, the organic matter digestibility decreased because of loss of nu uh, digestible nutrients from the silage. And that creates dry matter losses. But by use of uh, different kinds, of the, especially of the chemical additives, you could maintain the digestibility of the silage during that whole test period. So, in summary, I would like to say that dry matter losses during storage, it depends on what fermentation pathway uh, that these um, bugs in the silage will give us. And it varies with the condition of the crop being ensiled and also what dry matter content the crop has at ensiling. And uh, the dry matter losses occurring during feed out depends on the content of the yeast in the silage because they are the microorganisms that initiates the heating process. But we can decrease dry matter losses during storage and we can prevent heating of the silage during feed out by use of the right type of additive for the crop being ensiled. And in that way we can decrease the total dry matter losses from the silage. And thank you for listening. Great, thank you Emilia and Rolf and Elizabeth. While I'm waiting for some questions to come up, I would like to remind you all that tonight's webinar has been recorded and will be available to watch back on the Euro Dairy website, along with other webinars from the last two years. Um, so the first question that I've got coming through here is, um, it's a bit of a statement as well. Um, Rolf, this was for your presentation. There is no side sheet um, on the silo and that's why we have issues issues um, with losses, especially in the UK. And to, um, to go with that one, there is also a question saying, surprised to see silos with no side sheet. Is this normal in Sweden? In the UK, we would recommend side sheet as a first step to help reduce losses. Yeah, and what's the question? Um, is it normal yes, to now, see? Is now it normal? I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a big uh, discussion in Sweden, or uh, we have uh, without side sheeting and we have with side sheeting. Yeah. And um, uh, some people believe in it and some people do not believe in it. I personally am not so convinced that it is a very important thing. If you should have side sheeting, you really have to look out that it's completely tight. And I haven't seen a single silo without the tractor coming close to the wall and destroying the plastics. It's uh, then quite often not so tight anymore. And um, sometimes it's a good uh, action, particularly if you have very bad walls, but some walls are very nicely painted with some tarmac and things like that. And I have to remind you that the, the, the silos two things actually which was astonishing. That's the reason why I'm pressed so much on this compacting. The the farm that we were to three years in a row testing his very low uh, losses, he had no side sheeting and he has no additive. He was an organic farmer. 
he just put a lot of efforts into excluding the air by compacting and sheathing on top with sand, uh, plastic and sand. So um, yeah, it's a debate. Some, sometimes it's good with side sheathing, but um, I, don't, I think it's maybe 50-50 in Sweden. Great, thank you. Um, so the questions are coming in um, fast, so we'll move on. Um, do you have any advice on face management, i.e. how much better is a shear grab than using a rear handling bucket? Are you asking me, Rolf? Yeah. Uh, well, our advice is to adapt uh, this. I mean, you have to have a silo with a, a face which is in core, in, in balance with the number of cows you get. I mean, the, how many, how much you're going to take out of the silo. And we say that at least you have to take out two meters of the complete silo wall every week. That is the, the sort of recommendation. So you have to enter the silo at least two meters. So you go in, in you enter into the silo two meters per, per week. And that is in the winter time in Sweden. In the summertime, we normally don't feed the silage and because then we have all the grazing. And then you have to enter faster because it's warmer. So th th that's a question of the, the amount of silage you take out of the silo and the surface area, so to say. A small number of cows, you have to have a, a narrow silo, and uh, if you have many cows, you can have a wider silo. Great, thank you. Um, is there any research in Sweden looking at improving fermentation by conserving high sugar grasses? Uh, well, uh, sometimes when we, and in the iron siling trials, we have high sugar. Uh, concentrations, especially from the first cut uh, of the grass that we ensile. And we have done trials on that when we have had sugar contents like 15-20% of dry matter from the first cut. And we have, we have results on that. But uh, you might be thinking of the special varieties of grasses with high sugar contents that has been bred for high sugar contents. Okay. Um, we have another question for you here, Elizabeth. Um, where was the digestibilities of OM, um, OM digestibilities animal studies or NIRS predicted? Oh, it was in vitro organic matter digestibility according to the Swedish method, organic matter, where you add rumen fluid together with a buffer and have it fermented, uh, uh, incubated anaerobically for 96 hours. And uh, you ash and get the organic matter content, organic matter digestibility. It's done at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Uppsala, where Rolf works. Great. Um, and next question, um, is the heat generated through a poor fermentation or aerobic instability or combination both in data logged silage clamps? I think that's for you, Rolf. Well, the heat is produced from the microbes that have an aerobic um, pattern. So I mean, when the, when mostly when we have these heating problems, it's the yeast who have survived the long ensiling period. Because the idea is that the yeast should die during being uh, without oxygen for at least wow. eight weeks or ten weeks or something like that of ensiling period. But if it is not completely without oxygen, there are uh, aerobic yeast still around and when you open the silo they will start to grow from the both from the acids and from the using both the lactic acid and the sugars in the crop and the aerobic yeast they, when they start to grow they produce heat and carbon dioxide in great yeah. amounts. Uh, okay I just want to have a comment there because there are yeast that grow under anaerobic conditions too. Yes, and but they do not produce so much heat. It's when you have no. the yeah. aerobic uh, yeah. fermentation, yeah. You, you, yeah. or the, or not maybe fermentation is maybe not the right word. When you have the mm. uh, aerobic pathway, then, and then it, when you have a complete um, oxidation, then you get the heat. Mm. Yeah. So when um, you have the yeast, when you are making wine or beer or something like that, you don't get very much heating in that. I just made twenty liters of beer actually 
the other weeks. I measured the temperature because I was interested when I added all this yeast and it didn't rise more than one degree. <laughs> Um, there's another question comes through regarding this. Um, where you had the high temperature during ensiling, did you measure the yeast populations at penning? Yes, and the yeast population was very high. And there's another comment coming through um, regarding the um, side sheets. The problem is your clamps are small with very good walls. <laughs> mm. um, and another question, um, did you measure density in the study? I think this was a question for you, Rob. Yes, I mean, I, we mentioned the density in many, oh, you mean on these uh, big silos? Yes, we mentioned yes. the density, but we did, uh, well, we measured the density in different uh, ways, actually. We, we actually made an, an, a master thesis on how to me measure densities. There are different ways of mentioned measuring density. You could, as we emptied the complete silo, we could measure the size of the silo and the total kilograms, and when we got the real sort of true density. But that is difficult for a farmer to, to measure. And we discovered that we can just drill with a drill, uh, with a core, drill the silo from top to bottom and take out the, and weigh the content of the core and uh, take the dry matter and, and then we know the, the, the diameter of the hole that we are drilling with, with our core and the length of the hole and then we can and weigh the content that we are taking out from the hole and then we could calculate the, the, the density and actually this master thesis they, they came up to very good um, that we could uh, estimate the real uh, density in a very good way just by drilling. So when taking your sample out of a, a bunker silo for, for uh, making uh, nutrient um, determinations, so to say analysis, if you then take care of your, your sample and weigh it and may drill all the way down to the bottom, then you could calculate the density and that, that's quite uh, good news. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here, if a roller on the mower is recommended? A roller on the mower? Yes, I yeah. think we could say because we want to, as soon, as quick as possible, we want to get the grass a bit drier mm -hmm. from this 25% dry matter that it is when you cut it, we want to get it up to 30, 35 or something. And the faster you can do that, the better because you avoid the bad, the risk of having a shower or some rain coming, and uh, having a roller on the on the on the on the mower uh, makes it uh, dry faster. Mm -hmm. um, just to confirm, which are the best type of silage additives to reduce dry matter loss losses for a grass silage and b maize silage? Uh, for the maize silage, when it comes to the, uh, if you if you want to use the microbial inoculant, it would be we would advise the heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria, because with maize silage the biggest uh, problem is heating after you open the silo. Maize silage is pretty easy to ensile by its own, but the problems arises when you. Uh, open the silo because uh, it can start heating and the heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria will produce acetic acid which inhibits yeast growth. Uh, when it comes to grass silage uh, and if you want to use uh, bacterial inoculant even there, I would advise for the combination product where you have both homofermentative and heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria. If you want to, and also of course for both these kind of silages, also the chemical additives which already contains the active substances against Clostridia and against yeast will do a good job. Does acetic acid also reduce intake, Elizabeth? 
uh, well, then you need to come up to fairly high amounts of acetic acid to have an effect of intake. There are studies that have shown that no effect on intake uh, with the levels that we get in the silage. I think you need to come up to quite high amounts of acetic acid in the silage to have an effect on dry matter intake. Okay. And um, there's another question here for you um, regarding the additives. Um, yeah. Using the mixed homo and hetero, surely it depends on the ratio of the homo to hetero fermative species yeah. in the additives. The strains of each and the place in the silo in terms of oxygen penetration. So can you ever be sure which will dominate fermentation in every case? No, you can't. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, of course, uh, because you be, first you said you have it airtight. If you have an airtight fermentation, what's that what you said? No air penetration. Um, if it, if it, which one, can you say which one um, does the job? In what situation? We don't what? have a situation. <laughs> uh, I mean, okay. Uh, it's, this is biology. And uh, it depends on what, how much lactic acid bacteria you have on the crop from the start and how much heterofermentative, because you have quite a bit of heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria in the crop when you ensile it. And so by depending on the concentration on the crop itself uh, has an effect of if you will have the heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria being dominating during the process. Uh, it's an interaction with how much you add and also how much you, all, you already have on the crop. If you, so um, by using the homofermentative uh, lactic acid bacteria, you want those to get an efficient, as efficient fermentation as possible because they're specialists in producing lactic acid and in that way decreasing pH and they're keeping acetic acid low. <coughs> uh, for, for low dry matter losses during storage. But it's always a counteracting play bit game between what you already have on the clock crop and how much you add. But several studies have shown, you know, that an, an application rep of 100,000 is, is colony forming units of the lab per gram of forage seems to be efficient or up to a million when it comes to the homolactic, homofermentative. When it comes to heterofermentative lactic acid bacteria, well, of which Lactobacillus buchneri is the most commonly used, uh, there we have it, we add at least 100,000 CFU per gram forage. Yeah. Great, thank you. And the last questions, and then we will be out of time, is what is good advice if grass has dried really fast? or if you have very dry grass? If you have very dry grass, uh, I, would, uh, I would make bale silage. <laughs> because if you, if you put it in a bunker silo, it will be more difficult to compact, uh, to get, as uh, Rolf has pointed out to us, uh, you, it's easy that you get air penetrating in between if you don't get high enough density there. And it is, is difficult to pack enough when you have too high of a dry matter content. In a bale though, you want to have a dry matter content of like 40 to 50 percent. We recommend that. Uh, so I would advise you to make bales. Great, thank you Elizabeth. Yeah. And a big thank you to you all for listening. We've had a great turnout and participation in this webinar. Please keep an eye out on the Eurodairy website, which is eurodairy.eu, for future webinars.
The next webinar is this Wednesday with Dr. Asa Garcia and the topic will be the use of rapeseed cake in dairy nutrition. A very special thanks to Rolf and Elizabeth for taking time out of their busy schedules. The recording of this webinar will be available to watch back on the Euro Dairy website in due course. All those that have registered will receive an email alerting you of when it's live on the website. Thank you all and good night.